All right, good evening everyone. My name is Josh Brown and we are Constellation's battery thermal management team. In the world today, there's a great need for better battery management and um, especially failure mitigation. Pro this project addresses those problems. Slide, please. Four months ago, I brought to your attention recent issues of a catastrophic failure in the battery industry. I have three more examples of that today. Uh, just last week, a lady in North Carolina returned home to see her house smoking after her phone combusted while sitting on her kitchen counter. You can see an image of that in the top middle there. Earlier this month, U.S. regulators with the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration opened an investigation into LG batteries or LG energy solutions after Volkswagen, General Motors, Mercedes-Benz, Hyundai, and Stellantis all issued recalls due to battery issues in their electric vehicles. You see a burned out Chevy Volt here in this photo. Um, the issue that we are most interested in is with grid scale energy storage. But you see down here Moss Landing, which is the largest and one of the most sophisticated battery energy storage facilities in the world, had its second major event in the last six months in February and is now shut down indefinitely. The image there is of a battery fire at a similar facility made by, developed by Tesla in Australia. I should know. Thermal analysis is a key and largely untapped tool. We're looking at it especially for uh, grid scale energy storage, which is what our sponsor Constellation is most interested in. It is also a really important topic due to the fact that implementing renewable energies is nearly impossible without this technology. Most battery management systems use very complicated controllers that measure non-real and practically and physically confusing variables to make design decisions. One temperature measurement can be used in place of a variety of voltage, current, and other electrical measurements that are then fed through a sophisticated controller. This idea is still largely untouched and may be key to future battery systems. Our approach to this problem is to determine if battery thermal temperature data is an indicator of battery health and incipient failure. The first um, objective that we used to approach this solution was to use a controlled heat source. Right here, we, we built a controlled heat source that is able to, we call it a battery circuit that we're able to take measurements of and determine the fidelity of our measurement equipment. One temp, um, in order to associate battery health with with temperature history, we need to determine the best place to uh, position our temperature collection devices. One temperature measurement could be used instead of all these, all these other measurements um, and plugged into a, a uh, algorithm that determines potential failure. Shane is now going to talk to us about the test card setup we have. Hello, my name is Shane McCosby, and I'll just be going over the test uh, card that we made here. So, um, as we've tried to kind of introduce you to, um, our project's a little bit different than many of the others. This test card is not technically the actual end goal of our senior design project. We're really more so focused on um, testing out and developing diagnostic methods. So this is supposed to just be a tool to get us to our goal. Now, admittedly, we spent quite a bit of time uh, creating it. Anyway, so. Um, one of the main things here is that we have um, a moving air test section. Uh, the reason that we had forced convection or just that idea of air flowing over the battery in general is that um, we're trying to, to some degree, mimic our uh, sponsor Constellation, their uh, facility out in Clinton, Ohio. Um, so anyways, that's I'm going to talk about those two main systems. There's really uh, two goals, and uh, we'll just use the, uh, the cursor up here even though I don't mind. Can't do that anymore. So I'm gonna walk over and just show you. Um, so this is the test section in black here. Um, this is just a small wind tunnel of sorts to have a uniform and controlled airflow over the battery, or uh, in this case, for most of our semester, we were using the surrogate batteries as we were uh, testing out our methods. And then that's just fed through the duct here um, from the yellow blower at the bottom. Uh, the blower wasn't adjustable, so we had to make some methods of our own to adjust the airflow. And this uh, white PVC section here is an orifice blade flow meter that we actually created ourselves, um, mostly for budget concerns. And then that was just read through a manometer. And then our other main system um, would be all these brown wires coming out of the test section. Test section. Uh, those are thermocouples, just a, one of the common types of uh, temperature measuring equipment. 
Uh, those are reading temperature from the batteries or the surrogates inside uh, upstream at the battery and then downstream. And Reed will be talking a little more about that with some pictures. Uh, and then those are reading into the data acquisition unit here, or DAC for short, uh, which is then going to the computer for analysis. So Reed will be up next to talk about the surrogates and our power supply. My name is Reed Blackstone, and in order to test our ideas as far as thermocouple placement, we wanted a way that we could have more control over our testing parameters than using real batteries would give us. So we made these. This is a surrogate battery, is what we called it. Uh, it's a piece of copper pipe with a resistance heater running through it. Um, it allows us to essentially mimic the heat a battery would put off, but we have more control over it. And it has several other advantages as well. Uh, lithium ion batteries, as Josh said, are rather prone to uh, explosions or fire. And these surrogate batteries don't have that issue with them. Um, and, as, and as I said, they just allow us to exert more control over the testing conditions than an actual battery would give us. In order to generate heat, um, the wire leads were connected to the power supply, which is this over on the, the far side there, and a constant voltage was run through them. Uh, in order to um, simulate a charge discharge cycle of an actual battery, the power supply was cycled on and off manually, so we would spend a period of time putting voltage through it where it would heat up, and we would record that temperature data. And then we'd shut it off and let it cool back down as we continue to record um, the temperature data. We use two different configurations in our testing, the first of which is a single cell configuration, which are the ones shown here. Uh, a single cell uses one surrogate or battery. In addition, it uses four thermocouples. One of them is placed directly on the battery, as seen up here. One of them is placed downstream of the, thermocouple, uh, downstream of the battery, right here and one of them is placed upstream of the battery in the airflow. The fourth thermocouple is just for ambient air temperature to give us a reference point. Using the data we collected from these, we were able to analyze the best places to put the thermocouples to capture that temperature data. Uh, the second setup is the parallel cell configuration. Uh, we didn't actually get to use it with batteries, but we did use it with surrogates fairly extensively. And the reason for this configuration is because in a large battery bank, like you'd find in a car um, or battery storage unit, it's not a large battery, it's just a bunch of smaller batteries wired together. And so testing on more than one allowed us to simulate that more accurately. Um, and so what it was was having one surrogate mounted right behind the first. So there'd be one right here as well. And the only real difference between the two was that there was an extra thermocouple in that setup measuring temperature on the second battery. And here's Sam to talk about some of the calculations involved with that. Hello, everyone. My name is Samuel Sandanzillo. I'm part of the CFD team or computational fluid dynamics. So basically, it's one of our methods of analyzing the flow and thermal behavior of our system. So why did we do that? It was in order to find optimal locations of our thermocouples. This was needed to uh, accurately measure the temperatures in the flow, like right here, the inlet flow and the outlet flow, but also used to measure the temperatures of the batteries. So the three models you made from scratch was the first one is just a simple charge of one battery. The second model is charging, discharging one battery. And then the set third model, model is charging, discharging of two batteries. So what I did was focus on the geometry. On our right, it's a CAD part, and my job was to incorporate that CAD part into our CFD software, and that required lots of configuring with the geometries, but it was all quite necessary as we needed to select the regions of analysis and also apply all of the battery conditions needed for uh, the simulation. So after that was implemented, we also incorporated the physical uh, characteristics of our model, such as the battery density, thermal conductivity of the air, and also the battery. And once that was all set, I gave it to Sam Burge to run the simulation and also give us the analysis. Hello, my name is Sam Burge, and I was the second half of the CFD team. So with a CFD model established and confidence in our testing, assumptions, we could move forward running simulations focusing on heat transfer and fluid dynamic uh, analysis. 
with the end goal of trying to place thermocouples in the right spot and validate that downstream temperature measurement was feasible. First method of doing this was to run tests in a similar way that we would be doing on a test card. As you can see in the top image, the red dots show where data was collected downstream of, of the battery. As expected, the points that were closer to the battery, the discharging and discharging battery, picked up temperatures that resembled that of the battery surface closely. But, was, but what was a, um, a promising finding, which you can see on the bottom figure, is that even points farther downstream, um, in this test we have point, a point at three inches downstream, picked up the temperature fluctuations, leading us to um, move forward with our testing, confident that, um, that we could develop proper algorithms and analyze, um, analyze the batteries for uh, monitoring state of health. The other method that we use which we found to be a bit more helpful was uh, visualizing the air flowing over the batteries uh, using streamlines. So as you can see in both of these figures, a clear boundary develops separating the fast moving air with the slower air directly behind the battery. This zone of slow moving air, which we call the recirculation zone, was, uh, was a key finding. The air in the zone, which tended to hold temperatures uh, more similar to the battery temperature than those outside, um, led us to believe that thermocouples needed to be placed in these zones. As different testing parameters changed to, um, from inlet velocity and single and parallel battery cell setups, uh, having visuals for each of these uh, different testing phases was, was important because we needed to get our thermocouples inside of these zones. Next up will be Zarek talking about how we implemented these ideas in our testing card. So, uh, with the data made and uh, the specifications created by the work of Sam and Sam, uh, we were able to find a place to put our thermocouple behind the battery. Uh, this graph right here is our downstream, I mean, our, our surrogate, and this graph here on the bottom is our downstream reading. So what we found is that the uh, downstream exhaust could actually read the temperature off of the battery. So that means when we have you know our big systems, we can only we can actually look at you know just the airflow coming off of the back to be able to tell the temperature of the system. So the uh, current uh, <clears throat> testing uh, shows trends that. Uh, this can actually, we can actually monitor batteries without actually knowing their surface temperatures because we don't even have to touch them anymore. And this can also, this can also help us figure out whether there's higher current or a higher current being displaced by the batteries during charging and discharging just because of the heat that's getting released by the batteries. Another way to visualize the heat output from the surrogates is what we used was an IR camera. On the back side of the test enclosure, there's a, a square of IR plastic so that it lets IR uh, infrared waves to pass through it. And in this case, uh, this is the uh, parallel uh, surrogate setup. It's a little bit easier to see on the IR camera. Uh, and on the graph to the left there, there's numbers, uh, 1 through 11. Uh, there were pictures taken every 2.5 seconds, and um, this, they will correlate to this video here. At the lower temperatures, we saw that the background was mainly all one color. Uh, that meant that the surrogate was the same color as uh, the same temperature around as the background of the test enclosure. But as it heats up around five and six and seven, it can also, it starts to show itself uh, more prominently just because it starts to get hotter than the background. And that can help uh, with seeing how, if um, all the batteries are the same, uh, relatively the same color, all of them are about the same, uh, you know, displacement of heat, 
and if there's an oddball out, it may say that there's an, a, you know, like a sore thumb, it will show that uh, that battery might be going through some issues and might have to be replaced later on. So, next part of our testing, after getting specifications down and everything, we varied some conditions that we did. Uh, because, because of uh, the amount of air that goes over a battery, that can also change the surface temperature and the, down, the amount of heat that is in the downstream air. If, no, if there's no air movement, that means no heat will be downstream. Um, and then we also tried different testing surfaces. Uh, we had three different surrogates, um, all with different resistances. And when putting them in parallel with each other, you can show that you know, the two batteries will have different characteristics in their heat dissipation. And finally, I think one of the most important factors of our varying test conditions was having different duty cycles. Uh, when, uh, in this case, this was uh, char charging and uh, resting. Uh, that gives us these nice lines going up and down. Uh, when we have, uh, you know, these were every 15 minutes. We also had ones at uh, every 7.5 minutes. And then also we had ones that would go on for hours. Those ones that went on for hours helped us, for the surrogates, find voltages that would give us um, certain temperatures as it went down the line because it would, they move in a um, exponential curve. And so over time, it will slowly move to one point. Now, I would like to invite Shane back up to the stand to tell us about our batteries. Uh, sounds like I'm on trial. <laughs> um, hello again. Too much to join down, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I just want to make one brief comment that I think might be help to, helpful to clarify something. This is a, an aside from our presentation. Um, the reason that we're trying to measure temperature downstream is that in an actual battery installation, um, in the, kind of the end goal of our project, uh, it's not going to be feasible to have a thermocouple attached directly physically to every single cell whenever you have 2,000 um, in one of the large battery installations. Um, so the goal is sort of that can we predict signs of failure just in an aftermarket sense of um, having temperature measurements in the air coming off of batteries just from the cooling system. So anyways, we're the battery thermal management team, not the surrogate uh, pseudo battery thermal management team. So we of course had to try to move to actual batteries eventually. Um, so at that point we wanted to um, choose something that would be simple and industry standard, but also we wanted uh, as, as much as possible to mimic the batteries in use by our sponsor, uh, Constellation, at their Clinton facility in Ohio. Um, so we chose 18650 uh, lithium-ion batteries. They're about the si same size and shape as a AA, but just a little bit larger, um, although quite a bit more powerful. Uh, whenever um, put together in larger uh, packs, wired in parallel like we were talking about earlier. Uh, these are actually what older Teslas use in their batteries. Um, so they're just very common in uh, power tools, flashlights, and even up in the cars. Um, as far as criteria for which batteries we chose to buy and uh, test, we wanted to match the chemistry of our uh, sponsor's batteries as much as possible. So they use a mix of NMC and LMO, those are abbreviations. Uh, we weren't able to find any with LMO, so we uh, purchased NMC batteries. Uh, that stands for nickel and manganese cobalt, just referring to some of the metals inside the battery. And uh, that we were also happy to find that we could uh, buy some batteries that were manufactured by Samsung. Um, that's the same manufacturer as well that our sponsor uses. And then we needed, of course, a way to charge and discharge the batteries. Uh, you can't see it very easily right now in the car, just it's small and sitting down, but this is that same charger. Um, it had multiple bays so that in the future, if uh, we had gotten a little bit farther in the project, we could have uh, been doing those same parallel to maybe three or even four batteries uh, in a line. Um, we didn't get to get that quite far, uh, quite that far this semester. Uh, it was also able to charge and discharge the batteries without uh, removing them from the test section or, you know, using a DC motor to discharge or something like that. So that was also very helpful. And for our battery testing, um, we were collecting the same temperature measurements, one upstream uh, in the air thermocouple, one on the battery, and then one downstream, and then one ambient. Um, and we were varying the actual current um, being charged or discharged with the battery, so sort of the speed at which they're being uh, charged and discharged. And we were also varying the time scale, uh, so the cycles. Maybe uh, we started with hour-long charging, um, 
then we went to half hour, and then at the end, so it would be 15 minutes charging, 15 minutes of rest, 15 minutes dis discharging, 15 minutes of rest, and so on. Uh, next, Sam's going to be talking about safety a little bit. Hello again. So, yeah, we're testing batteries. So, like we saw in the articles that Josh showed, there's, there has been a bunch of battery fires. So, how do we prevent that? How do we stop that? So, there's actually a couple standards of certifications. The ones I looked at was the UL1642. It's basically a set of tests that uh, lithium ion batteries undergo. And once they get that certification, uh, the set of parameters under those tests are basically saying, hey, we can test these uh, batteries within that set of current and voltage to prevent uh, these potential fires. But say what happens if fire does actually happen? We also created a medication, and it's, we used a water-based extinguisher. And right here on the top, there's a hose right there. It's just the hose funneling water into our test section, just in the case that fire does arise. So um, data shows that, yes, we need to stop the fire, but we also need to stop the heating of the battery. So by using water, we cool down the battery, preventing the chemical reaction of thermal runway to further uh, increase the temperature of the battery, thus reigniting the fire. And with fire, there's also dangerous fumes coming through. So we also made a vent. Oh, we channeled the air and fumes in a way so that it goes through a fume hood so we won't be breathing those toxic fumes. So once we set up all those safety uh, mitigations, we are ready to test. And Levi will talk about our test and the analysis of it. Hello everyone, I'm Levi. So, in any time we're looking at battery failure, in the industry there's one parameter that is always used for any type of battery, especially lithium ion. And this parameter is called the state of health, aptly named because it's determining how healthy our batteries are. Essentially what the state of health is, you take the current charging capacity the battery can handle, and you divide it by the original charging capacity the battery can handle. And what this is, is just a measure of how healthy our batteries are. So as we cycle a battery, this battery here was cycled from zero to 8,000 cycles, we can see the state of health steadily decreases. And this is expected. All batteries, as you use them, they slowly just lose power and they lose charge as you go. And eventually, once they reach a point of state of health too low, they were tired. What our desire mainly was, was to figure out if we can find thermal signatures and batteries that determine whenever a battery suddenly jumps down in state of health. So if a battery is suddenly showing behavior that isn't normal, then we'd be able to pick up on that with our algorithms. So that's the main goal of our temperature analysis. So the one method we found that really works really well um, it's called differential temperature method. What you do with the differential temperature method is super simple. You just take the temperature curve that a battery gives off during charge or discharge, you differentiate it with respect to time, and then you plot it here against voltage. That's all you have to do, very simple. Here, these curves down here, all these curves are for a different cycle of this battery as it was run through its life. These curves right here are when the battery is very healthy and new and the state of health is very high. As the state of health decreases, these curves begin to move up and to the left. So we can see visually that there's something going on here that's worth picking up on. So what we did was we created a method called graph image shift analysis. And what this does is it takes a look at this graph and it figures out how much these graphs shift every single cycle. And then we plotted that versus the state of health of the battery at any given time. And as we can see, we found very encouraging results here where there's a very important correlation between state of health and dimensionless graph shift. So with this, we use NASA battery data that was already online. One thing with our project is we have not collected enough data to be able to do this because you need data over the life cycle of an entire battery. So this is just one important finding we found, but it didn't relate completely to the battery data we collected. But this is the first time this has been done on this type of data, so that's why it was exciting. So finally for our presentation today, we're going to be taking a look at a case study with some of our surrogate data. And essentially, we're just going to run you through, after we collect surrogate data, what do we do with it, how do we process it, and how do we use it to figure out if our methods can pick up on slight irregularities in batteries that might indicate state of health or unhealth in a battery. So we can see here on the left, there's a healthy data that we created, and it's just very periodic, very normal, and there's no major fluctuations in it. Then we created an unhealthy data set with the surrogate, 
and we can see that there's spikes and lower temperatures. And the goal of this was to simulate a battery that's having a little bit of trouble, just not as consistently working. And the main goal is to just use our data methods to see if we can pick up on this irregularity so that it could be applied to larger scale issues in a larger scale setting. So Ezra was going to come up and talk to us a little bit about Euclidean distance and other methods we use. Thank you, Eli. Hello, everyone. My name is Ezra Hedrick. And so now we got the temperature data before and after the battery. But we're going to need a way to be able to determine if that's different than how it is when it's healthy. And so I'll be going over one of our methods, which is Euclidean distance. And right here, at least what we're assuming, is that we see a change in Euclidean distance. There'll be a change in the state of health over time. And this would be in a comparison of a battery taken at one point when it's new. Then over time, as the battery ages and deteriorates, we try and evaluate that distance by comparing distances. And so what we see up here is just a general equation. Right up here, we have the signal from data 1, P1, which is our first signal. Then from P2, our second signal. And we're finding that difference between the two. Squaring it, so it's only the positive dividing by the amount of data points we have, and then taking the root of it to be able to get Euclidean distance. So from here, we have a simple example. Here, we have our first sample going through in blue. It goes from one and a half, two, back to one and a half. And then our second sample in red, which goes from one, one, and one, all the way through for our three data points we have. And in black here, we have the differences between the two. We have that P1 minus P2, going from half, one, back to half. We square this, add it all together, divide by the amount of data points we have, and take the root of it, we then get 0.71 as our including distance. So here we have it applied to our case study. We have it applied to our healthy data, as you can see on the right. Here we normalize our temperatures from 0 to 1, so it's unitless, it's easier to understand. And what you can see here in blue is our upstream before the battery. In the red, it's downstream after the battery, the air temperatures we're measuring. And then in black, we have the differences. And now, that's all good. We add it all together. We do the same process we did before the Euclidean distance, and we get a healthy measurement, as you can see in the table on the far left, of 0.31. That doesn't mean all that much. It's just a temperature measurement for the two the Euclidean distance. However, when we went through the case study and went through unhealthy data, we saw, for the first set, unhealthy, a 30% increase in Euclidean distance, 0.38 from 0.31. And then for a second unhealthy data set, we saw a decrease in Euclidean distance of 0.21. So from there, we can see and determine that by varying the state of the battery, by having irregular charging and discharging cycles, we can see a difference in the Euclidean distance relating to the state of our battery without having to measure the temperature of the surface of the battery or surrogate. Now from here, I'd like to have Josh come back up and talk about our proceedings further with our project. Yeah. Going forward, we really just need more battery data. We need especially batteries run until um, critical battery failure or thermal runaway. So due to time and safety concerns, the batteries that we did run, we ran at very low charging rates. But if we match those charging rates to those generally used in the industry, we'll see the same sort of thermal output that we, we saw and analyzed using our different methods like Euclidean distance. Another couple, um, another couple methods that we used were also called sample entropy and phase averaging. Both of these could be applied to more battery data as well. You can also use more simple analytic tools such as ANOVA and fractional factorial testing to determine differences in data. These could be applied in a similar, similar way. Our project this year really focused on establishing the use of thermal data to evaluate the health of a battery. We found that we could place thermal, thermal couples in battery exhaust air. This was really powerful because increases flexibility of the system. We proved that you don't actually need a thermocouple on each individual cell. You can read the air coming off of those cells and see what the temperature trends of the battery are. These are really major developments because as far as we know, we are a group of very few out there. We found a th uh, three maybe papers in the literature of people trying to do a similar thing. Um, so this makes it really powerful findings. And being able to predict battery battery health, battery failure, possible battery failure, with simple, measurable, and understandable temperature data would really be powerful for the battery management industry going forward. With that, um, does anybody have any questions? 